welcome today's Wonder at Home event on Urban Heat Resilience. This event is lucky number 13 in the Wonder at Home series. I hope 13 bodes well for this afternoon. My name is Brian Adair. I work in research development in the University of Arizona's Research Innovation and Impact Unit, where I help faculty get funding to support their research. And today we will talk about urban heat. And my guess is that you and the audience are from Tucson or you're a U of A alum or both. And so a lot of us are certainly familiar with heat. Um, I'm up at 5.30 in the morning to walk the dog. Or maybe you're lucky enough that you can get out of Tucson in June and July. And that strategy of escaping heat might not work so well anymore. We've seen the news about scorching temperatures in the Pacific Northwest, in Canada, really across the globe, even the Arctic Circle hitting 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And when we talk about weather-related risks, uh, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, wildfires, it turns out that heat is the number one weather-related killer in the U.S., and yet heat receives far less attention than other weather-related risks. So today our panel will talk about heat broadly. You'll hear from faculty from three different colleges, each with a unique perspective to discuss how urban heat is an underestimated and increasing risk in cities across the U.S. We'll talk about how cities can innovate to advance heat resilience through the perspectives of urban planning, public health, and housing. And before we get to the panelists, I'd like to acknowledge that we have a very big audience today. This was one of the most popular topics at Wonder at Home. And many of you submitted questions at registration that we will try to get to. And throughout our discussion, you can also submit questions using that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to as many of those live questions as we can. So let's start with the panel introductions. Lad, would you like to introduce yourself? Great, thank you so much, Brian. Look forward uh, to the panel today. My name is Lad Keith, and I'm an assistant professor in planning um, and chair of our Sustainable Built Environments degree program in the College of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape Architecture. And my research area is urban planning and climate change, specifically looking at how cities across the United States are addressing um, increasing extreme heat risk. And so today I'll draw from some of that national research as well as um, local examples from how I'm working with Tucson. And I'll pass it over to Mona. Thanks, Lad. Welcome, everybody. I'm an assistant research professor in the Melanie Nid Zuckerman College of Public Health. My research, research is actually focused on addressing health inequities in an adaptation planning and disaster response. So my work largely centers on building the public health system's capacity for managing what we call the society's wicked or complex problems, such as pandemics and climate change. On campus, I also teach several courses on disaster preparedness and climate change and health. And I'll hand it over to Mark. My name is Mark here. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Geography, Development and Environment. Um, and I'm representing the uh, College of Social and Behavioral Sciences here today. Uh, I'm primarily an economic and financial geographer with an interest in housing. Um, but recently, my, my focus has been on manufactured housing and the unique financial relationships that characterize that uh, submarket of housing. Um, and that has sort of accidentally turned me into a heat researcher because of the unique heat vulnerabilities of that housing type. And so right now, I'm, my focus is on the intersections of heat, health, and housing, in particular um, in manufactured housing, which is what I will primarily be speaking about today. I'm really excited to share with you some of the work we're doing today. Great. Thank you, Lad, Mona, and Mark for your introduction. So let's jump right into the audience questions. And if you don't hear your question read exactly as you submitted it, some of these questions overlap. So we tried to combine them with others. Um, Lad, this first one is for you, and it's a two-parter. It's what is urban heat resilience and how can it help cities address heat risk? Yeah, thank you, Brian. That's a good question to start us off with the panel today. So um, as you mentioned, despite being the number one weather-related killer in the United States, um, our governance structure around heat is much less developed for other climate risks like wildfire, flooding, uh, drought, uh, hurricanes, things like that. And so it's often uh, called the invisible climate risk for that reason. Um, so 
because heat governance is far less developed than the governance for other climate risks. Um, cities are just now starting to address it in many ways. And so an example is, while many cities have a floodplain management department that uses federal floodplain maps that are backed by FEMA, um, we don't have uh, you know, floodplain management departments or even, uh, we don't have heat management departments in the same way or heat staff. Um, and so that's kind of uh, put cities at a disadvantage um, for planning for heat. So really the idea behind urban heat resilience is that it's a framework for cities as they look forward with um, increasing heat risk to address both the chronic rise in temperatures, so those um, slow average rising temperatures over time, um, and then also acute risk, which is those extreme heat events. And you mentioned the Pacific Northwest heat wave. And we've had a couple of those heat waves ourselves. And so um, we can get into this later on in the panel, but um, heat resilience is really about both mitigating heat and the urban heat, um, so the urban heat island effect. And there's various strategies we can use to that. Um, and then also looking at heat management strategies on the public health and emergency management side. And so looking at both of those holistically, um, bridging uh, traditionally um, siloed disciplines, integrating planning efforts and utilizing um, new data sources that we haven't normally um, had to use um, in city planning in the past. Great, thanks for telling us what we're talking about today and defining those terms. Um, Mark, you mentioned this a bit in your introduction. Why are you so interested in staff? studying mobile and manufactured housing? Yeah, well, it's, it's because manufactured housing, and it's not an, this is not inherently the case, and I'll speak a little bit more about this, but it has the tendency to be this nexus of various forms of vulnerability, the sort of um, the opposite side of the resilience to vulnerability spectrum. And the reason why manufactured housing is more heat vulnerable is because People living in manufactured housing, especially older manufactured housing, tend to be more exposed to extreme heat. I can speak a little bit uh, more about that, uh, why that's the case in a second. Um, the population that lives in manufactured housing uh, tends to be lower income and older, so they're more heat sensitive, and they have less adaptive capacity um, in dealing with, with extreme heat. So the example I like to give is someone living in a an older uh, manufactured housing unit with very little insulation, um, living through a heat wave in Tucson. Well, you know what our adaptive capacity might be if you're if you're a middle class person living in such a situation is that you jack up the AC unit. Um, well, one you might not have the AC unit because your home just can't support um, an, an an AC unit, a heavy a strong enough AC unit because it's old wiring. But even if you can and you run that constantly and you end up with a $300 bill, then that might lead to other forms of financial vulnerability. So that's the first reason. The second reason is that the stakes are really high because there's a lot of manufactured housing. We don't think about this, but there are 22 million people in the United States that live in manufactured housing. And two thirds of those people live in the Sun Belt, right? So these are, these are places that are going to be experiencing more extreme heat events, it living in heat sensitive structures. And then finally, the reason, part of the reason why these structures become so um, um, heat insecure, heat vulnerable over time, is because they are not treated the same way as other housing types. Um, oftentimes, they're, they're zoned differently that dis in ways that disadvantage them. For instance, here in Tucson, um, you can't locate manufactured housing in residential areas. Um, oftentimes, the consumer protections that are available to people who want to purchase a manufactured home are weaker than those for other homeowners. And it's very difficult to access financing for manufactured housing, especially older manufactured housing, let alone um, financing to make improvements that might improve the, uh, you know, the adaptive capacity of that home. Um, and um, so those are just a few of the reasons why I'm particularly interested in that nexus of um, heat, health, and housing in this sub-housing type. Yeah, thanks for talking about that. Some issues we might not all appreciate and um, understand. I, I've been seeing a lot of the questions um, even coming in now and that were submitted ahead of time. They're questions from the audience about what we can do. Um, I think many times we might feel like heat is just something that happens to us. Maybe we can't control its effects. So Mona, this question came in. It was, what can local stakeholders and partners do to build resilience around urban heat? That's a good question, uh, Brian. And I think I'm gonna piggyback on what Mark and Lad were talking about. 
Um, I think one way to look at resilience is if we pull from the disaster preparedness language. If you look at resilience, it's that capacity of a community, of a neighborhood, of a society to bounce back after a stressing event. So if we consider that urban heat, you know, a heat wave, that stressing event, and we look at some of those demographics that Mark was talking about, if we really want to understand and build that capacity for a society or in a community to rebound, we need to understand what those underlying demographics, what those underlying needs of a population are. And this is where local stakeholders, local you know, NGOs and other partners really come in. Because if you think about it, these are often the organizations that local community members actually rely on for maybe information, other services. And so these individuals and these partners can really help us understand what some of the issues that people are facing on the ground. So decision makers can make informed decisions. But then also on, on a second fold, we hear this in, in a climate change context a lot. A, a solution that's relevant for Tucson may not be relevant for Seattle, right? So we need to understand the cultural context, the competencies, um, involved with the local population. So it, that's a long way about saying the second, I think that the, the second way these organizations can really help is help us tailor the messages. Um, we know that there's different communities, they have different barriers and access to care. They have different sources of information they find very trustworthy. And so we can really partner very well with these local organizations and representatives to make sure that the messages that public health the, the energy sector, all of these agencies that are in the business of responding to a heat wave, um, you know, are, are making those, those can be salient to the, to the end public that we really want to be protecting and helping. Yeah, I think Mona. I don't know if you saw the question in the chat, somebody had asked about, can any of the panelists speak about the role, role of culture in different cities um, with respect to heat? adaptation and mitigation. So thanks for that. And you also mentioned um, how different cities across the U.S. face heat risk. Glad, do you want to talk about that? Because I know you've been speaking with different cities. Um, I know a lot of us today in the audience uh, are in Tucson, but what do different cities do? Are there ways for cities to partner? Yeah, that's a great question. And so um, cities across the United States and across the world do face different um, heat risks. And I think um, despite that, I think the important thing to note is that due to both climate change and the way that all cities have kind of built and planned their built environment, um, heat risk is increasing for all cities, um, kind of regardless of the region. And so while we're used to heat in some ways in the Southwest, <clears throat> last year, you know, was a record breaking, um, it was, uh, we had the highest average annual temperatures in the Northern Hemisphere. Last year broke a lot of records in Tucson and actually Arizona recorded about 60% more deaths than the previous year last year. And so even in the Southwest where we think we're used to heat, we're still trending in the wrong direction as far as our planning efforts go. Um, so I have done interviews and surveys and kind of plan analysis of how cities are looking at heat across the country. Um, you know, there are some regions and um, I'll call out the Pacific Northwest because of that heat wave that we spoke to and looked at their plans. And while they were very aware of climate change, they ranked other concerns related to the climate higher. So obviously wildfires have been a big concern up there. And when we spoke to them specifically about heat, um, they viewed it as kind of a far off future um, risk that they had to think about later on, but not today. And I think what we saw with that heat wave um, that really shocked kind of the nation and the world was this isn't a 10 or 20 years out problem. Um, it's going to get worse in 10 or 20 years, but this is something that we have to think about today. And we're kind of already behind the ball um, in all regions and planning for heat. Um, I think you had asked um, who can cities partner with too. Um, you know, there's, because uh, it's a growing kind of governance area, certainly support from federal agencies um, like NOAA, CDC, EPA, you can imagine like the laundry list of federal agencies that are all involved and in, um, particularly really important when they provide those resources to smaller and uh, medium sized communities that aren't lucky to have a university, tier one university, um, like Tucson is kind of centered in Midtown. And so a lot of those other um, cities are still at heat risk, but um, require a lot of those federal resources um, for their planning efforts. I think in Tucson specifically, um, we're really fortunate we have um, groups like Team Association of Governments, and I'm thinking of them because they have um, hosted one of the nation's longest um, publicly accessible 
um, urban heat island maps, which is our regional heat severity map. And so a lot of different groups across Tucson have used that for planning efforts um, for almost a decade now. And then we have um, really strong nonprofit groups like the Watershed Management Group, um, which I'm sure a lot of our audience has heard about them and kind of their efforts to make sure that we can help green our city, which uh, mitigates heat, but doing so in a way that helps save our precious water resources. Um, and finally, I'll mention, of course, universities are a critical component in kind of advancing city planning efforts. Um, and again, I think we have a really strong partnership with a lot of the governments in our area here. Yeah, go, uh, Mark, go ahead. Yeah, if I could just interject, I just wanted to build on on the, this question around culture, and I think you know, Lad points out all of the the really important ways in which um, there can be an institutional culture that increases adaptive capacity and, and urban resilience. But I just wanted to highlight from some of the research that we've been doing on on manufactured housing. Uh, a lot of manufactured housing in Tucson and other places takes the form of a park or a, a community, like of, of very similar types of units. And oftentimes when I look at on paper of who lives there, the age of the housing, I think, wow, this is an extremely heat vulnerable area. And from some of the interviews we've done, we've realized that there is far less heat vulnerability in, in these places because of the social cohesiveness of some of these neighborhoods where people really look out for each other, they check on each other, they feel comfortable sharing um, cool spaces together, um, even sometimes in the midst of this pandemic. Um, and so I, I think that that role of culture uh, to the extent that it um, improves social cohesiveness uh, can really enhance um, adaptive capacity in the face and, and help people recover from those, from those shocks and stresses that uh, Mona spoke about. Do you want to keep talking about that a little bit more, Mark? Because my next question was for you. It was the connection between extreme heat and housing. So you're talking yeah. about um, community, but just sort of more broadly, uh, the connection between heat and housing. Yeah, well, I mean, I think this is important to point out. You know, time use surveys suggest that Americans spend about 90% of their time indoors. And for older residents or those with medical conditions that are likely to be made worse by the heat, that means spending time at home. Um, and so I, it's, it seems like a, like a contradiction in terms, but a lot of where we, we will experience climate change, where we will experience this extreme weather associated with climate change, whether that's, um, you know, um, extreme heat or other types of events, it's going to be inside, <laughs> right? We will be living climate change increasingly inside. And so when we think about adapting to climate change, we need to think about those indoor environments. And we need to think about that because that's primarily where we go to deal with extreme heat. We just go inside. We spend less time outside when, it, when, the, when the temperature is too high. But some people going inside does not necessarily mean cooling off. And it's hard to know who among us that's, this, that's the situation for. And so what we're, I think what we need more research on and what, what we're trying to do with some of the work on manufactured housing is to think about this issue of home thermal security, you know, which is the ability of a household to maintain a strict, stable home thermal environment that's consistent with, you know, basic social um, health and financial needs, right? And I think it's important to point out that, you know, when we look at these heat associated deaths, um, increasing, a lot of those are taking place indoors. We don't think about, that's not where people's heads go immediately. Um, but um, if you look at the data from Maricopa County, where the data on, on heat associated deaths uh, is, is quite good, um, until recently, um, about 40% of those heat associated deaths were taking place indoors. Interestingly, um, this past year, and I think it's something that heat research will have to think a little bit more about, um, we had a, a record, Lad has already pointed out the record um, for heat associated um, deaths this year, but a smaller percentage of those took place indoors. And I wonder what role things like um, the utility shutoff moratorium played there, um, or where frankly were CARES Act checks, we think about those as general stimulus or, or relief checks, but I can tell you from interviews, those were, those were utility assistance payments, <laughs> right? And so I think that, um, yeah, that's, I think we really have to think about climate justice and climate policy being about housing justice and housing policy as well. <laughs> 
Yeah, and maybe Mona can pick up on uh, that, thinking about the recent events in mind that you just mentioned, Mark. Um, what can cities really be doing now to prepare for the future heat waves that we know are coming? I'm going to piggyback on what Mark just said also. Uh, climate justice, I think social justice is definitely something that should be front and center. Um, and if we think about what, you know, we've all experienced, and I, I think we can say this globally now, in what we've seen over the past couple months or so this summer, I think what comes to mind first is, you know, we tend to look at this and we really need to think, think of these issues not in silo, but, all, but more in synergies. Uh, disasters rarely, as we have now seen, um, happen in isolation. You can have a heat wave on top of uh, a power outage. We saw heat waves coming in the wake of COVID. So we've traditionally, when we look at uh, governance and we look at planning for these type of events, we often do tend to think of one thing at a time. And we really need to start broadening that scope and taking a look at how these synergy, synergistic, uh, unfortunately, impacts are going to impact our local populations. Making it come back to the climate justice movement and really that framing, I think it's very important for uh, cities and communities to, to start looking at um, vulnerable populations. Uh, Mark has highlighted one set of vulnerable populations, but we often think of social determinants of health. So we think of age, we think of how much you earn, where do you live, but also where do you work? Think about people who are working outdoors during these um, extreme heat waves, those working in the construction labor sector, those that are fixing your ACs if they break down. I had, a, I had that experience this summer, my AC broke down for two weeks. So how, how, you know, what, it, what are the health hazards for those communities? I think is very, very important. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of branch out here just, just for a second and, and really call attention to um, the importance of planning. We, we all, I think, really focus on developing that plan. We need to have that heat, heat wave or extreme heat plan. I think what's equally important, if not more important, um, than that plan and product itself is, is um, the collaboratives, the, the network that we build, because it's more important um, for, for entities, for governances, for communities to really start understanding what are some of those key players um, locally that are going to be your partners in addressing things. So for example, we've touched on electricity and the electric se sector. So if there is a power outage company, uh, or uh, a power outage that is likely in a community, how can we work to understand who are some of those most vulnerable community members that are homebound, um, that we can make sure that their power should not get cut off or would be one of the last you know, um, populations that, that electric companies could look at. So those kind of discussions are, I wanna say, are actually more important for us to have um, and I'm not going to just stop there. I will say, you know, working with businesses. So really looking at those partners across sectors to start discussing those solutions. Because even if you don't have a plan tomorrow or a month from now, it's those discussions that are really going to come in very, um, going to be very instrumental when that next future heat wave or any climate driven event happens. That's great. Mona, you're making my job easy. I think you're looking at the chat about the questions about silos integrating public and private services. Um, so thanks for answering that on the fly. Um, that's fantastic. Um, Lad, what is next for cities that are pursuing urban heat resilience? Maybe you can talk about your work, your research, and where, where things are going next for cities. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so I think, you know, we've been trying to raise awareness about extreme heat risk, again, both on the chronic side. So it's not just those extreme heat events that happen, but also those um, kind of slow rising temperatures that are putting populations at risk. Um, so, I, but I think the heat waves have been a wake up call certainly this summer. And so, um, you know, there's been kind of every year that I've been working on this, there's been a little bit more media attention, a little bit more research coming out. Um, just this spring, Miami-Dade County in Florida um, appointed its first chief heat officer. And um, again, going back to the point, there's thousands of floodplain management professionals, thousands of wildfire fighting professionals, and 
wildland management professionals. This is literally the first, um, you know, appointed person whose full-time job is just thinking about heat in Miami. And so that just shows kind of how far, again, we are behind the ball with um, dealing with heat compared to other risks. Um, but that's a, that's a good step. Um, the city of Phoenix, uh, to the north of us, of course, um, created a new office of heat management and response, and they're currently in the process of hiring the person that will lead that. And so I think those are two good examples of the direction we may be headed. But of course, that's two cities out of the 14,000 communities in the United States. So, so we have a long way to go. And, um, you know, I think the larger cities will dedicate more specific resources and attention to heat. Um, but, you know, many smaller towns and smaller cities in the United States have let alone, you know, one, one planning professional that also does you know, the engineering and sometimes as the public works manager and all of those other roles. And so it's for those smaller medium towns, um, you know, you can't expect them to uh, dedicate as much attention to heat. So again, that's where the state and federal um, kind of support really comes in and is so important to make sure we pull all of those communities forward and not leave anybody behind um, as heat increases as a risk. Well, I'm going to try to squeeze this question in here then. Someone asked, um, you talked about the federal uh, the role of federal government. They, the question is about FEMA does flood maps, of course, and that guides and sometimes even prevents development in certain areas that are prone to flooding. And the question is, can heat maps be used by cities in the future to prevent new development in areas that are going to get hotter? Is that coming? Have you seen any of the sort of analogy to FEMA? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think the, the major difference between those two risks is, um, well, one, one is federally backed by the government and used for insurance purposes and has been around for decades, right? And so it's widely accepted, um, even though FEMA floodplain maps for anyone that has used them are not always accurate and go through um, kind of recalculations and arguments and court cases all the time. I think the difference with heat maps are, um, thus far, they've been developed very differently. And so some are satellite derived, some are based on ambient air temperatures. Um, you know, they use different ways to calculate heat severity and display them all differently. And so until we have a national standard for heat in the same way, I think it would be hard for local municipalities um, to start litigating or regulating uh, development specifically based on what they see on a heat map. Um, but what we do see happening in cities is they are starting to starting to refer to their heat maps and including those uh, those heat severity indices and kind of their calculation of what they are asking developers to include. And so if a development goes in in a location that's in the hotter area of the city, um, I could imagine in the future that a city may ask for, you know, increased urban forestry, decreased parking lot sizes, things like that. So. I think it's really important, of course, to do that in partnership with the private sector so that we can still have kind of thriving, economically uh, vibrant communities and that we don't, um, you know, overregulate just for one specific issue. But OK, great. So that that helps thinking about the future. And maybe, Mark, you could talk about the present. I mean, what can be done right now to help people who live in heat vulnerable places like the mobile homes that you mentioned? or it might be difficult or impossible to, to keep their home uh, cool. Yeah. Um, th yeah, thanks for that question. And thanks, I think that um, what I'm gonna say builds well on what, what Lad has already said, but there's a caveat that I always try to squeeze in whenever I talk about um, heat vulnerability in manufactured housing, um, which is that there's nothing inherently insecure or vulnerable about housing that's built in a factory, <laughs> right? There is, um, uh, and I, I basically don't want to reproduce already existing stigmas associated with mobile and manufactured housing, which actually um, help produce and reproduce vulnerability in many ways. Um, you know, there is um, high quality, energy efficient manufactured housing out there. And despite the fact that I have focused on vulnerability, I think that, um, you know, part of the solution is actually more manufactured housing. <laughs> um, and so what the challenge that, that we have is to figure out what the nature of the gap is between the best examples of manufactured housing, the most resilient examples of it, and the least or the most vulnerable. And to figure out what it is that holds that gap open, where that gap is the widest, and how we can close it. And you know, I'm I'm actively working with some people that are here today, um, including including Lad on this exact project. But in the in the more short term, um, there are some very specific policy interventions that can be made. Um, and I'll just give a couple of examples here. So one of the primary um, 
inter- federal um, energy assistance programs, and actually that funds a lot of, um, of local energy assistance programs, is the Low Income um, Housing and Energy Assistance Program, or LIHEAP. And typically to access LIHEAP funds, you need to do that directly through your utility. Um, but people living in older mobile home parks um, often do not pay their utilities directly to the utility. They pay it through a submetering company. And as a result, they're not eligible for that, that you know, the largest um, home energy assistance program in the country. Um, and our colleagues up at ASU have found a relationship between lack of access to those funds and indoor heat deaths, right? So this is something where we can really expand the eligibility of uh, to some of these um, utility assistance programs to help people that are living in uh, heat vulnerable housing types. One of the other things we could do, um, the most heat vulnerable manufactured housing is the, is the stuff that's on the landscape that was put there before 1976 when there were standards that required a decent level of, of insulation or that required wiring that could support um, a stronger um, air conditioning unit. And right now, um, when an older park closes down, funding is provided at the state level um, to relocate that housing. But for a variety of reasons, that's essentially impossible. So what we could do is we could reach, so the people that are the most vulnerable are actually not able to benefit from that program at all. But there's something that we could do. We could make those funds available, perhaps perhaps for a down payment on a more energy efficient home that could be placed elsewhere. Right, so those are very small interventions um, that could make a big difference, at least in certain in the lives of certain households. And then I also think that there's um, there's something there's a there's a wonderful alchemy <laughs> to manufactured housing, or there's that it, it it offers this ability to provide um, a way to for people to buy only what they need which is a roof over their heads without having to spend money on this thing that gets more and more expensive. And we have probably all seen it on Zillow and other places, the land underneath, right? So what if you could only purchase the structure? And that's what manufactured housing allows you to do. But that can also create some insecurity. When you own your home, but not the land it's on, that's an inherently insecure situation. Um, but there are various ways in which we can solve this problem that are not being invested and not being embraced sufficiently. Um, and these could involve different types of public-private partnerships so that the, the land would be um, held in perpetuity or you know, could not be sold for other reasons um, for a certain period of time. Uh, a land trust could own the land that the housing is on, or perhaps it could be um, a nonprofit um, or even, even public ownership. Um, or perhaps the residents could pool their resources and actually purchase the land collectively that their home is on to have a cooperative. And these are all these all exist to to some extent around the country, even even in Arizona. Um, but they're a very small slice um, of the total um, manufactured housing population, and and they could be grown substantially. And the little bit of research we've done suggests that these models are are better at producing. Um, a resi- transforming a vulnerable, potentially vulnerable housing type into a resilient housing type. So I'll, I'll just stop there. I think that's great. It's proposing um, solutions to some of these inequities. Um, maybe this inequitable burden um, that you've introduced here, Mark, uh, maybe Mona or Lad, do you want to chat about that as well? Um, how do we address inequitable burdens that some communities experience beyond, um, beyond the housing aspect that Mark was talking about? Sure, Brian. And one thing I did want to say, um, you know, if you if you look at the some of the solutions that Mark proposed, um, they they could they take us back into that social determinant of the health that I mentioned earlier, and that's you know, and, and what I would really like to encourage everybody that's watching this is to really look at um, how solutions to something like housing and transportation not only benefits and addresses that aspect of an individual's life and lifestyle, but also has what we call co-benefits, co-benefits to human health. And um, as a public health person on the panel, of course, I'm going to uh, make that, keep making that push for public health, but it's really a central piece um, because taking care of that anxiety associated with, you know, where I live and how much risk I have, do I own that house? Um, And possibly if we can implement these um, programs that Mark discussed, we're not only taking care of some of the innate risks involved for heat, 
But then also, um, we tend to ignore the mental health aspects of, of um, heat waves um, and any and other climate-driven um, incidents. And I think that's a really critical piece. Um, mental health, we, we've seen, is a critical piece of, of, of overall human health and well-being. Um, the stressors along with where we live, if we're able to go to work. So again, bringing the occupational health aspect into it. You know, you work, but you take your work home with you. You, tra- you, you know, you're working outside, you're, your body's in stress, you come back home. And if you're coming back home to an environment that does not allow you to cool down, um, you carry that physical and mental stress with you, which has um, long-term consequences. And I think when we're looking at... Um, really the inequities um, where we can use those tools that we were talking about before, like mapping, but from a social behavioral standpoint. So there's an index called the social vulnerability index, the SOVI index, that really takes some of these social demographic facets into account and assigns a, a, an index value or a risk value to locations. And we need to start integrating those mapping tools that Lad had discussed you know, how we look at heat, how we place um, future um, localities or housing developments, but combine that with um, facets such as access to food, access to transportation so people can get to work, um, and look at those in a more holistic systems thinking point of view, um, and taking that approach to addressing inequities rather than taking a piecemeal one thing at a time and then coming back and trying to figure out, you know, how this piece fits in. It's, it's a more holistic approach that I think that needs to be uh, adopted. Uh, did you want to take it too and follow on what Mona was talking about? Yeah, sure. No, and I, I love this because usually it flips it around for me because when I do um, speaking events or panels, usually I talk about um, the urban heat island map and there's been a lot of research that has shown the red line neighborhoods, minority, um, majority neighborhoods, lower income neighborhoods across the country, kind of regardless of the actual city, have higher heat severity than their wealthier, wealthier and whiter counterparts. And so that's something that numerous studies in the last couple of years have kind of proven time and time again. Um, so usually I have to say that and then bridge to, but don't forget about all of these other aspects of inequity that also impact heat. And I love that uh, Mark touched on the housing parts. Um, Moda talked on the social demographic um, pieces that really tie into healthcare. Um, so those are just so important too. And thinking through things like um, energy access, like Mark was talking about and the affordability for indoor cooling, making sure that that's um, not turned off if someone misses a payment um, during the summer, which is the hottest part of the year, which could um, create really dangerous situations. Um, I'd also add in like the digital divide is really important here because a lot of the populations that are most at risk, you know, people's experiencing homelessness, those don't have cell phones, those that aren't connected to Twitter or, you know, keeping an eye on the news every day. And when we do get those heat warnings from the National Weather Service, um, you know, who are those warnings reaching and how can we make sure that that information gets out to those folks that aren't um, connected to everything else, um, like, you know, able to watch the Zoom panel on uh, through the internet and all of that. Um, so I think, you know, research is uh, doing a better job at documenting these inequities and helping raise awareness about it. But I would say for the city perspective, um, we have to make sure that we actually don't just talk about it and our actions kind of follow on board with this. And so we um, actually put public resources towards um, strategies that prioritize those that are most at risk. And I think one way that we really need to do that is by having equitable kind of participation processes. And so the you know, decision makers aren't just deciding what to do to people and just you know, giving them solutions that aren't actually the solutions that people need. So I think involving, um, you know, in uh, improving our public participation processes, making sure that everyone can participate in democracy, whether it's for a local, state, or national election is a key part of this. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I just think the equity focus is so important for heat, but then kind of on the flip side of that, I'll be my own devil's advocate. I think sometimes, especially um, on the academic side, we can get so focused on equity, that's all we talk about. And then it in some ways can turn off the general public because um, like Mark was alluding to, um, if all we talk about is equity and vulnerability with heat, it becomes an issue that people think doesn't affect everyone in society. And so I would say the flip of all of this is we do need to focus on um, inequities of heat, 
but you know, heat affects everyone um, on the Zoom, everyone in the city of Tucson, regardless of kind of your wealth or your um, you know racial status or anything like that. And so. Um, you know, questions like you were mentioning before, can you walk your dog um, at a normal time of the day? Or is it an extreme heat event that's um, furthered by climate change and you're having to skip your outdoor exercise? Um, can your kids play outdoors during, uh, you know, their school time? Or do they have to spend um, heat days inside, which my kids have had to do before? And that's not something that I ever had to do when I grew up in Tucson myself. And so kind of thinking through um, you know, making sure that we focus on uh, equity, but then we also are talking about this in ways that improve everyone's quality of life and um, don't leave people out of the conversation. All right, well, let's do something that's really popular then um, and practical. I see a lot, you know, we're going to talk about trees. There's so many questions coming in about trees. Let me um, read a few of these people asking about mesquite bosques, which I think there's still a few of those around. Um, let me read some of these just to acknowledge these are great questions. The average tree canopy in Tucson is about 68%. What percent is needed to make a noticeable difference in cooling Tucson? That's a great question. Um, how do we balance the need for greenscaping while keeping in mind that trees need water and Arizona is in a drought? Yeah, I just planted some native trees. Uh, even the ironwoods and the mesquites need some water for a couple of years to get established. Great question. If we maximize the number of rainwater trees by planting them, in and adjacent to residential streets. What would this do for the heat island effect? Yeah, so professors, the audience is asking some straightforward questions, but I imagine these answers get complicated thinking about all the different factors between uh, how trees and other vegetation uh, interacts with our environment. Maybe, maybe let's ask this question a bit broader and see if we can combine them. In general, how does, how does urban forestry, urban greening, help to mitigate heat in the built environment and what considerations should cities take into account with respect to heat mitigation through greenscaping? Lad, I know you just spoke. Do you want to take the first shot at that one? Yeah, sure. So um, again, kind of through the national surveys, interviews, plan analysis that we've done, regardless of the city, um, urban forestry and kind of associated urban greening tactics like green infrastructure, um, park space, are by far the most popular strategy that cities are looking at um, to help reduce the urban heat island effect. Um, and you know, if there's good reason for it, urban forestry helps provide shade. So it kind of lowers your thermal, uh, it increases your thermal comfort low by lowering the temperature. If you're a pedestrian in those areas, provides habitat for animals, has co-benefits for other climate risks like decreasing flooding. So there's a lot of really good things associated with um, urban forestry and all of that green space. Um, one challenge, though, is that it has become viewed as a little bit of a silver bullet. And so, um, you know, we often have million tree planting campaigns in different cities across the United States. But what we need to do is make sure that those trees are planted correctly. They're the right species. They're kind of sited in the right place so that they can have, you know, a long life and the investment is well spent. Um, and that we also uh, fund, in addition to the cost of planting the trees, that we also fund their long-term maintenance to make sure that they're kind of appropriate for an urban environment too. Um, and oftentimes cities will go uh, go in on the planting side and then kind of forget about the maintenance side. And so I think um, remembering the maintenance cost is really important. Um, you know, and of course in the Southwest, we're in a mega drought. So one of the worst droughts, um, certainly in modern history. Um, and so thinking th through things like um, the water usage of trees, and I know, um, you know, the city of Tucson, Pima County, Watershed Management Group do a fantastic job of uh, focusing specifically on drought tolerant trees and native tree species. But even those trees during a year like last year where it doesn't rain at all will require some form of watering. And so kind of thinking through that water use versus the benefit that we get. Um, and I'd say there's um, just other heat mitigation strategies um, that we should consider too. And so trees are one important one. Um, conserving natural lands and doing things like um, growth management is another important one because uh, sprawling cities tend to have a larger urban heat island effect than smaller compact well-built um, densities. Um, so thinking through things like, um, you know, overall land use and transportation planning. Um, and then there's other specific strategies that we can do in the built environment. Um, like uh, some cities, including the city of Tucson, are, are starting to pilot uh, cool paving uh, pilot projects where um, when those roads are due for um, their cool or their paving um, recoding anyway, they switch a product and use one that's just slightly lighter. And so it absorbs a little bit less heat and reflects a little bit less of that off. And so I'm um, kind of thinking through those tactics and 
you know, um, for decades in Tucson, we've done things like painting um, uh, roof ho uh, house roofs white. And so, you know, looking at other buildings that don't currently have those um, in place and seeing if we can switch those over too. Yeah, Mark. If I could just sort of chime in here and, you know, um, who could, who could, who could uh, disagree with, you know, planting more trees. Um, but I do think it's important to um, think a little bit about some of the trade-offs and some of the um, conversations I've had with um, uh, people on boards at um, local manufactured housing cooperatives um, or um, owners of manufactured housing communities can sort of speak to this, these trade-offs. One of the owners I spoke with when I asked about, you know, trees as a heat mitigation strategy said, um, I, I love it, it's a great idea just not for my parks, <laughs> because there was a concern that they would be a threat to the infrastructure um, underneath these parks, that they would be quite expensive. And um, you know, this, is, this was actually one of the, the most common areas of concern for residents of manufactured housing communities was disputes with management over things like water bills, because there are so, leaks are so frequently uh, occurring. And I can say that in uh, some of the, the, the nicer communities where there are lots of trees, there's often very specific reasons for that. For instance, they're on, they're on a natural spring, <laughs> right? So where the, where the water for maintaining these trees is free or very low cost. And in one particular community, they, this is a, you know, 200, 200 um, units, they were spending $30,000 a year to maintain these trees. So um, I think there's a there's a tendency to think this is a just a trees are a win 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 win, uh, but there are um, there are some costs associated with there are some trade offs, and there and, and because of that, in certain environments, um, other other types of mitigation strategies um, should be considered in addition to or instead of um, more tree canopy. And Mona, I think we chatted earlier. There's even public health concern with trees. Is that right? I mean. There are, so I'll, I'll use a, a personal example for that. Um, you know, in, in, and I'm all for trees and I think, uh, you know, Mark and Ladd um, touched on all the, I think, key points that I would have uh, mentioned as well. But I think from a public health standpoint, especially here using Tucson as an example, some of our native species like the Pella Verde, right? A mesquite, um, they're, they pollinate and we have, you know, a considerable, considerable amount of our population that's elderly have chronic diseases, respiratory diseases like asthma, COPD. And so thinking about from a, from a healthcare standpoint, um, that balance of, you know, I need to plant a tree and that the only options I have are some of these ones that are high pollinators. Um, you know, do we, you know, what are some of the trade-offs that we need to keep in mind in terms of making sure that these with, with, you know, the duration of the spring seasons and the warming temperatures extending into more days in the year, what kind of impact could that have on um, those that are suffering from asthma and some of other respiratory diseases? But one thing I do want to just um, put out there, um, Brian, for, for consideration is, you know, what trees are a good solution. We know even beyond trees, things like school gardens are, are highly valued. Um, and we have that we have a good movement here in Tucson to do that. And, and I think as, as we kind of move forward in, in strategically thinking through those solutions that are tailored to our local communities, we need to think about, uh, again, I'm going to bring out the geography, uh, geographical aspect of things. Where are we implementing those solutions? We don't want to unintentionally um, concentrate our solutions in one area of our community and really think about maximizing that benefit um, and taking it back to SOVI and vulnerable populations, really thinking about strategically um, the cost benefit, where are the communities um, that could benefit from these more? Uh, because we do know that green spaces do create more cohesive neighborhoods um, and bringing back that resiliency piece. So I, I would just, you know, caution uh, putting that perspective when we make those decisions as communities uh, on where we're going to concentrate solutions. Yeah, that's really good. I'm going to look. I check the time. We're almost out of time. There are a lot of questions coming in. People want to know about solar arrays um, and other aspects in and around Tucson about cooling. Maybe, maybe let's skip what we plan to do. And could we talk about, Mona, what you've been doing at schools or 
um, teaching children about urban heat. Uh, there was a question about could 4-H or other programs um, on topics like agriculture be a way to introduce the effects of heat. You talked about these school gardens and I know you all teach at the university, but I suspect you're doing other things in and around Tucson with K through 12. Does anyone want to tackle that? I, I can I can just start off um, um, with this, and I think 4-H is a really um, great avenue for for us to collaboratively across sectors again and disciplines um, really engage um, the community. And I'm gonna you know I have a seven year old at home, and when she learns about last last uh, spring, the the theme for a good two months of the class was reducing water wastage. And so naturally, when she came home, mom got to learn about the different ways mom can be with mom could reduce water wastage and what mom could be doing better. Um, and so I, I use that as an example because um, kids, youth are force multipliers, they're communication multipliers. So I think um, as we, I think 4-H is a great avenue, um, tapping into these existing infrastructure and programs like school gardens program like the STEAM initiatives that are currently ongoing, I think it's, it's worthwhile to um, not only think about urban heat, but maybe expand it to a resilience perspective because, and look at bringing that co-benefits aspect um, to the angle. One thing I haven't seen before, which I would, which I would love to see, and if you know, the university can be the champion of this, is um, and when we look at these solutions, especially when we're engaging, whether it's students in the university classes or, or um, you know, in K-12, um, we often forget that they are already living through the impacts of climate change, of urban heat. And so um, I think we need to do a better job of acknowledging those lived experiences and integrating them into the educational framework, bringing it back to mental health. Um, they already have had, and may have had experiences that put them in situations where they did not have access to air conditioning. So using that as a, as, a, as a platform to learn and engage, I think is something very, very important that I have yet to see in my experiences in, 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 in this environment. Lad, um, Mark, you're, I'd love your thoughts on that. And I know we're running out of time. I'll just mention really briefly, I'm involved with a Recharge the Rain uh, project, and that's through the Water Resource Research um, Center at the University of Arizona, um, the Watershed Management Group, um, Arizona Project WET, and it's funded by NOAA's Environmental Literacy Program. And what they've been doing is installing rainwater harvesting gardens in K-12 through schools across um, the entire uh, Tucson region, and then having those kids learn about um, how they can capture that rainwater, um, kind of the natural benefits that it has. Um, and so kind of my component was bringing in um, those little heat temperature readers and getting the kids out into the schools um, to see how those um, rainwater harvesting gardens can reduce the temperature at their schools too. And so that's been a really powerful thing to have those K through 12 um, children kind of learning about heat in a really sophisticated way. Yeah, the introduction of citizen science. I'm going to ask Mark um, for your final thoughts, too. I know you're about to speak. We've got a couple minutes. Left. Yeah, um, I was just going to say, because I, I heard you mention photovoltaics, and I, I couldn't help but think about um, some of the alternatives to, um, to trees for providing shade. Um, and I, I, I certainly, I'm not the only one, but have been exploring the potentials for um, um, solar panels in, in a manufactured housing context. But there are ways that you can maximize the co-benefits of solar power production within a, within a shade-strapped area. I have a colleague actually that studies the growth of plants underneath solar panels. And, I, and we, I, looking across the street, I see cars staying cool under solar panels and parking lots. But we don't do that for housing and we could start doing that. And if there's any housing type that lends itself to that solution, it's manufactured housing. Because one, you can park it underneath there. Um, the, the, uh, the, the structures are often in need of greater shading and they could make use of some of that um, lower cost um, renewable energy. Yeah, Mark, I think you're referring to uh, Professor Greg Baron Gafford's work locating the plants under the solar panels and it turns out you get better crop production when they're in a bit of shade. Um, Mona, do you have any final thoughts? I think what I would like to just kind of convey to the audience today is, um, you know, 
we, we discussed a lot of solutions and I don't want you to think of, think that, you know, there's a lot of new things you have to do. Uh, I'm going to use the COVID um, response and recovery efforts that cities globally have been engaged on. And I encourage everyone to think about how can we leverage the, the equity work, the, the systems, the partnerships that we've already put in place to respond to COVID and now to recover from COVID. How can we successfully leverage those to create sustainable programs that address the social determinants of health, the inequities um, in our societies today? And Lad, do you wanna leave us yeah, with your final thoughts? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so to, I would just reiterate that urban heat resilience is a rapidly growing area of both research and practice and throw out that we did a literature review of all of the um, heat planning papers in the world and found that 60% of them had been written in the last five years. And um, kind of, again, going back to the point, we only have one chief heat officer in the country and one department of heat management that doesn't even have anyone hired as of today. And so um, we, have a, we have a long way to go. And I think the University of Arizona um, should absolutely be a leader in heat research and translating that research to practice. And again, kind of from this webinar, you can see um, not just the three of us, but we have uh, strength in this research area, you know, whether it's CAPLA, um, you know, geography, public health, kind of across all, a lot of other departments and disciplines and colleges that aren't represented here on this webinar. So, so I think, you know, our strength as a land grant institution and connecting research to practice um, could really make us a global leader in the area of um, heat resilience. And I just, can I just build very quickly with a, a very brief final thought on what Lad was saying? Um, we do have, we do have a lot of, of features that make us, a, you know, a potentially strong center for research on extreme heat. And I think that researchers have perhaps a, you know, a, a very important role to play in all hazards. But I think there's something unique about the invisibility of heat uh, that makes research really important. It's often only through research uh, that the places where um, heat impacts people, you know, um, in their homes um, at night, um, that, you know, heat does not produce the same sort of dramatic, sort of charismatic mark, marks of, of destruction and suffering, like torn off roofs, down trees, flooded living rooms. And so it really is incumbent on researchers to help figure out, well, what are the, what are the indicators that we need to be worried about? Right, that will allow us to better identify those who are in need of interventions or supports. And I think it's really important to invest in this because there's something else about heat that's really important to recognize is that most um, heat illness and, and most heat deaths are preventable <laughs> in a way that perhaps deaths from other house hazards are not, right? So not only are the solutions out there, but these solutions can be, you know, very transformative. I mean, they can actually eliminate many of the many of the health impacts that we're talking about today, and that um, that we're all hearing about in the news today. I think th thanks for that, Mark. And I think we have to stop there. Um, I want to thank our panelists for their enthusiasm, their sincerity, their passion for the topic. I think we could all keep going for another hour, but uh, we're not going to do that. I want to thank the audience for all your questions and engaging with the University of Arizona. A recording of this discussion will be sent out to all attendees, as well as links to additional resources. And you can also go to arizona.edu and type wonder at home into the search box. It's going to bring up upcoming events, past events, but that's it for this afternoon. So we'll say thank you, everybody.